Thanks, everybody, for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to get right to it because I know you're all anxious to hear from Dan and Jack Schwager. There was a question about will you be able to ask Jack questions. Yes, we will be moderating the question box. If you have one, put them in the question box, and we will uh, get to them all. Um, Dan may take a break, or we may wait to the end. We'll see how it goes. But either way, put your questions in there, and we'll make sure that they, we get those answered. So I just wanted to introduce our Q&A interviewer for today. It's uh, Dan Blystone from TradersLog.com. If you haven't been to his site, if you don't follow him, make sure you do on Twitter and also go to his website. He's got some great articles there about trading that I think is good information for anybody who wants to get into this. So, uh, Dan, I'll let you take it from here. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tim. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us today. I just wanted to check if everyone can see my screen okay. Um, I've got uh, a page with uh, something of a review of, of Jack's book with uh, some of the key points on there. I just want to make sure everyone can see that okay. So if you can, please just type in a yes. Great. Excellent. Okay. And I will uh, just paste in a link to so people can refer to that. On from the internet rather than just this screen. Okay, and um, so now after having thanked Tim from Money Show, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> make a special thank you to uh, Jack Schwager, something of a legend and an icon in our industry for uh, taking the time out of his busy day to join us. Uh, Jack is perhaps best known as the author of the best-selling Market Wizards uh, series. However, his uh, market experience is not just academic. He's currently the co-portfolio manager for the ADM Investor Series Diversified Strategies Fund, a portfolio of futures and FX managed accounts. His prior experience also includes more than 22 years as a director of research for, some, for several of uh, Wall Street's top firms. Uh, and the impetus for the, uh, the webinar today uh, was to cover his, his latest book, Market Sense and Nonsense. And uh, so that's really what we're going to talk about. And at this point, I'd like to welcome Jack. Jack, can you uh, can you hear me okay? And can we do a mic yeah, check? You're fine, Dad. Excellent. You're fine. Welcome, Jack. Um, well, you've mentioned in, in previous interviews that you feel that this book is your most important to date. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, the impetus behind this book and uh, why it's the most uh, significant one for you so far? Okay, well, I'm speaking from a personal level, and I qualified that statement by saying that I think actually for most readers, I, the Market Wizard series will probably still remain their favorite books. Uh, but this book is entirely my own voice. The Market Wizard, I, I'm part of the conversation, but certainly not the focus of the conversation, uh, which I shouldn't be. And uh, I'm there to elicit opinions and concepts and ideas and stories and anecdotes and whatever from the people I'm interviewing. Uh, here I'm basically uh, uh, talking about all the things that I've observed or come to believe uh, are true and not true about investment and trading in general. And over the years, uh, actually I've given talks, uh, lots of talks, and most of them fall into one or two categories. Either they're market wizard based and uh, sort of lessons of the market wizards, versions of that, uh, or they're uh, sort of misconceptions of about investing type talks. And I've been collecting those misconceptions and wanted to put them into a book for quite a while. And so I'd intended to do it for uh, maybe 10 years. And finally had the opportunity to have some time to write a couple of books in the last couple of years. And I took the time to write it then. Excellent. <clears throat> well, perhaps we can dive in and, and look at some of the most uh, important misconceptions about investing that you've identified in the book and perhaps some that will relate most to our readers, I think. So I think the first misconception you cite, and we can see this if you follow along on the, uh, the screen here. Just scroll down a little bit. So investment misconception number one is that the average investor can benefit uh, by listening to the advice of, of the financial experts. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on your general skepticism uh, on the advice of financial experts and talk about some of the examples you cited, such as uh, Jim Cramer? Sure. Well, I started off with Kramer, not to pick on Kramer, but because it gave me a sort of an interesting anecdote. Uh, we're, we're tying together The Daily Show and, uh, and Kramer. But this goes back to a famous episode in The Daily Show in March of 2010, 
where John Stewart went on a bit of a rant against the, uh, uh, the CNBC. And his, his beef was that uh, CNBC was uh, there throwing stones at all these people, particularly homeowners who were so stupid they didn't see the, the uh, crisis coming and they bought houses they couldn't afford. And God knows there's plenty, uh, plenty of homeowners who acted irresponsibly, but of course they're just one of many, many players. There are tons of people who, who uh, did stupid things uh, or worse than stupid fraudulent. But in any case, uh, uh, CNBC was taking the high road and criticizing. So, his point was that, hey, they missed the entire financial crisis themselves. So he proceeded to play these clips from various CNBC shows about related to financial markets. And he would have, and, and Kramer was one of the ones he picked, and Kramer probably had more clips uh, than anybody else. But he would have something like a clip of Kramer um, saying, I think you should buy, 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 you know, in a standard uh, yelling uh, tone. And the, the black screen would, uh, you know, would show that the, the Dow was at 13,000, then three months later, Dow 10,000, and would show clip after clip where the forecast was completely wrong. So I kind of thought to myself, uh, gee, you know, anybody, you could take anybody's predictions and you could cherry pick them, they're going to look pretty poor. So I really wondered, is that, was that fair? And it turned out in doing the research for the book, I found an academic paper that had taken all of Kramer's uh, recommendations. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, it took it from the beginning of the show, turned them into portfolios, and uh, it, it ended, the study ended actually about two weeks before, this, before the Daily Show episode aired. So it was, it was actually this very, very per, uh, exact uh, to match the same uh, point in time. So uh, what basically it found that if you had uh, had the stocks that Kramer recommended, you would have made on average about 2.5% uh, provided you had the stock the day before the show aired. Uh, right. enough, unless you knew what he was going to predict, that that wouldn't have helped you very much. Uh, if you bought the stock after the show aired and held it for 50 days, 100 days, so on, they did five different uh, holding periods, it turned out those portfolios lost between 3 to 10% annualized. So um, they actually did worse than that relative to the S&P. So they actually did a bit worse than the S&P. So that was like one. And, and I should add here, because I really don't want to knock Kramer, Right. That, that he was a hedge fund manager for many years, and he did very well. So twenty-four percent, uh, right? Twenty-four yeah, percent so, net so, compounded. <laughs> yeah. So he did. He did do very well then. But but based on the the, you know, what we're talking about the the recommendations that appear on the show. If you literally took all of them, hey, the academic study says you would have lost money relative to just being, you know, or made less money than if you had been in stocks, or you know, just it was a relative study to the uh, index. So he did worse than index result. Okay, but that's just one guy. So then I. I uh, did a couple of other things. I, I, I talked a bit about the, the Wall Street Week, you know, the, the Elves Index, the Elves Index and, uh, and uh, how, you know, he would, he would uh, Ruckheiser and uh, would be polling these 10 technical analysts every week and, and having an index based upon their recommendations. The idea, if the majority of them were bullish, it was good, and the majority was bearish. And it turned out that they only got really real buy and sell readings fairly intermittently, but they happened to just be perfectly bad. So you would get, you know, sell, sell, sells right at the bottom of the uh, 84, uh, 94, uh, right before the bull market took off. Then you got sells right before the crash. I'm sorry, you got buys. Uh, you had sells in there at 94. You had a sell right at the peak of 98 before the crash, and then you got the, this, this, this uh, it buys at the peak of the end crash, and then you got the series of the strongest buy readings ever in, in, at the early 2000 period. So it was just like, it was just, pre and finally Rook Heiser just pulled the plug on it after 9-11. I think he was afraid that after the markets reopened, they were that sharply lower, that it was going to be uh, giving a sell index, and I think he knew where that was going to end up. So, um, and a lot of people were sorry to see that index go because they'd come used to it as a contrarian index. Now, um, that, that is also just that one index, but I thought the most reliable thing to do was to look at the whole industry. Okay, so right. you have a whole industry of newsletter writers, and people are paying them money, <laughs> hundreds of dollars or more a year, because supposedly the recommendations are, you know, are uh, you know good or you know, give you some sort of an edge. Other so, otherwise, they wouldn't pay. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? I mean, you're paying, you're not paying to get recommendations that could do worse. Than <laughs> right. And uh, but but in fact is the fact is that well, okay, so I looked at it, and over the past. 30, and, and Hulbert, I got to thank Mark Hulbert here because he, 
He's done this wonderful work of take, converting all these newsletter recommendations into actual portfolios. And he's got this deep database, and he was kind enough to share it. So I uh, really appreciate that on his part. But the bottom line is the, that, that that data showed that if you just you know, threw darts and picked pick managers, you, you, know, you would have done worse in every decade than the index. OK, so you're going to say to me, hey, you know, we're not that stupid. Uh, you know, I'm not just going to pick any newsletter. I'm going to pick the good ones. I'm going to look at the ones who have been right. So I did that. So I looked at the ones that were the best newsletters for the past three years, past five years, and did that every year. I repeated that experiment. You know, I took the best three and the best five of the past, you know, the, the ones that were the best in the past three years, the ones that were the best in the past five years. And how did they do? And lo and behold, they did worse than the index too. So uh, yeah, you could tell who you could tell who the top newsletter writers were in the past, but that wasn't predictive of their being better than the index going forward. So bottom line is. You know, there was there was no positive edge. If anything, there was a negative edge. And, and so my, my ultimate <coughs> advice is, uh, out of the whole process, that people really shouldn't be listening to experts. And they should be, well, you either, you got to categorize yourself in one or two, one or two types of people. Either you're someone who really likes the markets and analysis and likes getting your hands dirty and, uh, and thinks you can develop, have a trading methodology that is a little bit better, and uh, you, you want to do that process actively, and fine, go for it. And uh, you know, if your your account will tell you if you're how successful you are. But by all means, you know, then you should try to do. But then you should still not listen to the experts. And if you don't want to do all that, if it's too much work, then just buy an index and forget about it. But again, you shouldn't listen to the experts. So that's that's my advice. Right. Yeah. I. Uh... I read this on a Kindle, and the most popular highlighted passage on the Kindle uh, kind of talks to that point. It's the one that says, my advice to investors is to buy an index fund, but not after a period of extreme gains, or if you have sufficient interest and motivation, devote the time and energy to, to develop your own investment or trading methodology. Neither of these approaches involves listening to the advice of experts. So I thought that was kind of interesting that most the more, more 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 highlighted than anything else in the whole book. That's it. I, I didn't realize that, and that's actually, um, yeah, I think that is the core, the core of the, the thought. Exactly. Excellent. Okay. Well, moving on to, um, I think the second uh, investment misconception is, is worth covering, and that sort of uh, speaks to the uh, efficient market hypothesis. Um, market prices are perfect and discount all known information. That's the investment misconception number two. Can you talk about why uh, efficient market hypothesis is flawed, why the investment community are drawn to it and like to use it, and talk about, finally, some of the disproofs that you've talked about uh, in the book and in interviews such as the uh, 1987 crash or the internet bubble? Right, right. Well, there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of things there. So yeah, yeah. I, I had a bit of fun with this because, well, for even to this day, uh, the efficient market hypothesis underlays a large amount of academic uh, opinion about how markets work and also about how a lot of major portfolio managers manage money and how a lot of pension funds invest and um, all the concepts of portfolio optimization and uh, option pricing and you know just almost every aspect of, of finance relates to this underlying assumption of the efficient market hypothesis and and what goes with it, the idea that prices are normally distributed. distributed. And the, the theory, you know, sort of is wrong on, it's wrong on many, many levels. I try to show it. But before I go why it's wrong, the importance of this is it goes to the very heart of, of whether you should do anything. Because if the efficient market hypothesis is correct, uh, what it's basically saying is you can, there's no way you can do anything to beat the market. Uh, not technical analysis, not fundamental analysis, nothing. So anything you're doing, if you make money, if you do better than indexes or whatever, it's just pure luck, and you might as well not bother trying because everything's in the the market is always right, and anything that happens is instantly discounted. Now, right. <clears throat> those ideas are you know basically wrong. Uh, the fact that they're wrong, by the way, uh, and uh, before I, before I go why they're wrong does have important implications, and the implication is if they're wrong, it does mean that at least theoretically the markets can be beat. It doesn't mean it's easy, it might still be very hard to do, but it does mean theoretically the market can be beat. That's a very important distinction. Now why it's wrong? Um, well, the market price is always right. That is 
that's something that can only be believed by someone who has not been intricately involved in markets or is blind to, to reality. There are just so many instances where the market price is, you know, blazingly, screamingly wrong. And I, and I include, you know, a number of those in the book. But we can take, for example, uh, the, inter the fame, you know, internet bubble. And I don't have to go back to the internet bubble, but it's just a good classic example. So you have internet stocks. And they, in, in, in 17 months' time, they go up literally 600%. 600% in 17 months' time. And then, for perfect symmetry, in the next 18 months, they come down 84%, which works out the exact same amount, take it all the way back to where they started. So you have this huge mountain. They go up tremendously, uh, and they, then they go all the way back down, all in the space of about three years. And if you believe the efficient market hypothesis, you'd have to believe for the first half of that three-year period, you had all this bullish news coming in about Internet stocks, all these bullish fundamentals, which people didn't know, and it was all coming, constantly new news coming in, and the market price was going up. And then all of a sudden, you had this whole thing change, you had a whole bunch of bearish news come in, and it all went back down, which is utter nonsense, because what you had was a bunch of companies which were never making money, which were burning through cash, which were, you know, forget about trading at ridiculous multiples, there were no, there were no multiples because there was no earnings. So, I'm not true of every internet stock, but a lot of them. And what simply happened, at some point, everybody turned around and these things were trading these, had gone up by these incredible amounts and they, they were just, they were not making any money and people started to sell and, of course, once it started going the other way, there was nothing to stop it. It wasn't that there was any great news coming in or, at, or on the way up or the way down, it was simply that there was a story, the story got, you know, a lot of hype and started going up, that built its own uh, greed and people started buying and everybody else saw their neighbor buying internet stocks and getting rich, so they, they were buying it and, and of course at the end everybody was holding worthless stocks and they all went back down to where they should have been to begin with. So the whole thing up and down really was on, almost all of it was pure emotion, it had nothing to do with, with the market price being right or news coming in. So the whole framework of the way they look at markets is just basically wrong uh, because markets are two things. They are they are based on, on fundamentals which, which move the market in long-term streams and they're based on emotion and emotion has, sometimes emotion does not not a big deal but when you get real markets, uh, big moves, then emotion becomes a big deal. And I like to say um, market moves begin on, emo on fundamentals and they end on emotion. Uh, so that's so that's what's wrong in terms of the the way they the way that theory describes the mechanics, and that's a, that's one example. Right. There's um, but there are lots of examples, and one I always like to pick out because it just shows the complete absurdity of of this type of thinking of the efficient market hypothesis, and that is the famous October 1987 crash. Now, in that particular one day. The market went down 29% in one day. And um, if you believe in the efficient market hypothesis, you believe then the prices are randomly distributed and uh, follow a normal distribution. 29%, I forget how many standard deviations it was. It was a, you know, a tremendous amount of standard deviations. But what I do re uh, recall the number of is what the probability of getting, getting that type of one day loss if in fact the market, the efficient market hypothesis were true. And what it turns out is that uh, the probability of that is 10 to the minus 1 60th. Now that is a number that is so small that you, you can't comprehend it. So I had to come up with an analogy. Uh, I was trying to come up with an analogy of what that number was. And so I put in, I went to Wolfram uh, on the, uh, the math site on, on the internet, and I put in number, on a lock, I put in number of atoms uh, in, in, in the earth. And they had a number, and it was much too small. So then I put in number of atoms in the universe, and they actually had an estimate. And the estimate was 10 to the minus 80th, uh, 10 to the 80th. Now, 10 to the 80th times 10 to the 80th by luck happens to be exactly the probability of getting that event uh, of the stock market crash. So to put this in crack in a visible, visual term, the probability of getting, if the efficient market prophecy were correct, probability of getting that one day crash is equal to or equivalent to the probability of randomly picking one atom from the visible universe, the entire universe, and then repeating the experiment 
randomly picking up Adam and getting the same Adam. Slightly Adam unlikely event. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's beyond unlikely. It's as close to impossible as you can get. And so, you know, clearly, you know, almost a mathematical proof that it, that, that it can't be, be correct. And, then, and you have things like uh, the famous uh, Palm, uh, I won't go into the whole thing, but we had the spin-off of Palm, which was the iPhone of its day, and there was such a stereo of the spin-off, even though 3Com, which owned Palm and was, and was worth 1.5 shares of, of Palm, people were paying a lot more money for Palm than they were for 3Com, even though 3Com was equal to 1.5 shares plus the rest of the company. So you have people paying a huge negative dollar price to buy Palm uh, instead of, you know, uh, three, they were valuing 3Com at a large minus number uh, hmm. for the rest of the company, which is, again, is absurd. So you have all these proofs of the, of the theory not being right. And can you talk for a second about why the investment community looked to efficient market hypothesis? You mentioned a few times the analogy of the drunk looking for his keys yeah. in the parking lot. Yeah, exactly. It's because it allows you to answer. It's really, I think, the academics get, get the most of it because not, they're, they're looking for ways to quantify, quantify risk, quantify, you know, how much you should put in each, you know, uh, in each investment, you know, optimize things. They want to get uh, hard numbers. And the great thing is if you if you if you assume the markets are efficient and there's a normal distribution, then the normal distribution allows you to make probability statements about. Uh, about or any type of an event that allows you to measure everything. So you can measure it and you can give, the, oh, you should have 60% stocks and 30% bonds and 10% cash or whatever. You can come up with these hard numbers mathematically derived. But the problem is it has no basis. It, yes, you can come up with it, but the, if the assumptions are wrong, then the output is going to be completely wrong. And I, so the analogy you mentioned is exactly that. It's the, the old cliche, the cliche of the, of the the drunk who drops his uh, car keys at night uh, and then looks for them, um, looks for them under the uh, lamppost because that's the only place where there's light. Not because he remembers <laughs> that's where he dropped them, but that's the only place he could see. Right. So that's what that's I think the analogy that that's appropriate. It's because if you can get answers. They may not be the right answers, but you can get answers, and that's why I think people uh, tend to use it. And I think there's also, uh, you know, a nice thing to say. Well, you can't beat the market, so you just uh, it, I think people like to say for that reason too. Um, there is a, by the way, I, I should, I want to add this one other thing, which I think is really, really important about how this whole way of thinking is wrong. It's the whole idea that if everybody knows all the same information, then it's impossible to beat the market, right? And that's, that underlies this whole premise. Well, you can't beat the market. Everybody knows, everybody gets the same news. Everybody knows the same information. You know, it's a waste of time. Okay, so my, my answer to that is, you know, go to a chess tournament. Now, I guarantee you all the players there know how to move the chess pieces. They all know the same chess books. They know the classic games. They know all the opening moves. They know the same information. They have access to the same information. But you'll have, you'll have masters like you know, Kasparov in his time who will crush the opposition. And you have the regular players. And, there's, and, they, and the regular players can have no hope of winning even though they have the same information. So it's not what information you have. It's how effectively you use that information. Right, which leads into um, investment misconception number three, which uh, is it's not possible to beat the market. Um, and here I wanted to, to bring up uh, the famous quote from Michael Marcus from I think it was the original Market Wizards book. And this is a guy that traded $30,000 into $80 million. And this is the famous quote that was brought up again in the new book. Um, and it says, you have to follow your own light. As long as you stick to your own style, you get the good and bad in your own approach. When you try and incorporate someone else's style, you often end up with the worst of both styles. Um, so going back to investment misconception number three, it's not possible to beat the market. Uh, Jack, can you comment on why and how it is possible to beat the market as evidenced by someone like uh, Michael Marcus or Jim Simmons or, or Ed Thorpe, who who are sort of disproofs sure. of uh, the efficient market hypothesis in themselves. Right. Okay, sure. Well, take Marcus and I, you know, Michael, um, and when you mentioned that story about Michael turning $30,000 into $80 million, you know, people may kind of raise their eyes and say, well, that's not, well, you know, basically Michael was a commodities corp. I actually was a commodities corp also myself, and, and you know, basically that's true. Okay, so he did it. Uh, it sounds impossible. And he not only did that, he did that uh, with them taking about 20% of his money out every year to cover expenses. So 
they actually made more than that. They were just pulling money out. So, um, and I knew Michael personally, just to give you an idea, and here, here it goes to the idea of how you use information. I'll give you a little anecdote. Um, Michael and I used to, when he left, uh, you know, the job, my first job as a research analyst, he left the, that slot, that's how we met. He was leaving that position. I was coming in to be interviewed for it. And um, he was leaving to become a trader. And he was still in New York for a while, and we used to get together um, for lunch every, you know, a couple of weeks. And so I remember back in the 70s, there was the cotton market, and, uh, and I, cotton was one of the markets I was an analyst for. And so I did all this analysis. I went back and I studied every, every single uh, cotton market from the post-World War II period, and you know, what the supply-demand was, and what the government programs were. And I basically came up with the, the, the conclusion that almost every market had been controlled by the government programs. There were only about three or four uh, free markets, truly free markets during that period because it was surpluses. But there were some shortage years, and based on those shortage years, I was able to, to say, you know, okay, well, this year looks like the, the most, bullish, most bullish of those years. We went to 35 cents, so our target's 35 cents. And so I was bullish, you know, looking for that, and so was Michael. But once we started getting to the mid-30s, I started to look for a top. I figured the buy was about as far as the market should go. And, and Michael, uh, who didn't do any of all, you know, all this fundamental analysis or anything else, he, he was just absolutely convinced the market was going much, much higher. And why? Because that was the first year uh, China, which was then called the PRC, uh, was, be, was a, a buyer of cotton. And it was the first time that was a, that was a new fact. And he was, he was smart enough to understand. I mean, he had a hundred facts to look at, like I did, but he knew which fact was the important fact. In this case, it was the Chinese buying. And he could see how that would change the market relevant, that the past was not relevant anymore. This was going to change the game totally. And so he was bullish for the long way up. And I mean, in cotton that year went to a dollar. It actually went three times as far. The, the price tripled from where I thought it was fully priced. So just to show you how far off I was. Um, of course, almost nobody was looking for that. But Michael caught that because he understood which was the, um, which was the item to, to look at. So we had the same information, right? We had the same information. But he knew how to use that information much better, even though I may have done more work to, you know, to get to the conclusion. Uh, so that's an example of, and, and Thorpe, uh, Ed Thorpe, who probably most people know, he's famous mostly because of his blackjack book, you know, Beat the Dealer. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, he changed, for those people who don't know, uh, he changed the way casinos operate, the multiple decks and the shuffling and the, all the, you know, the whole thing. That's all because of Thorpe, because he kind of put out a book on how to actually win a blackjack by betting properly and counting cards. <laughs> and he did the studies based on mathematics. He was a, he was actually a, a math PhD. Uh, and he was, a, he actually would have had a, a physics PhD, but he never finished his thesis for that. Uh, he got derailed getting his math PhD. He never went back to the physics PhD uh, or thesis to finish that up. But he was a, a money man, hedge fund manager, one of the first hedge fund managers. He ran two funds. His first fund, he did extremely well in both, but his first fund, uh, Bridge Line Partners, uh, Prince, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that was the second fund. His first fund was Prince of Newport Partners. 19-year record, gross returns of 19% annualized, but that's not, the, that's not the big kicker. The big kicker is he had 19 years with only three losing months, and the, uh, his, all, his losing months were all less than 1%. And wow. so that type of record, I mean, he's like a walking embodiment a walking uh, proof that the efficient market of is wrong. There's no <laughs> way anybody could get a track record like that. A walking uh, disproof. If, if the markets weren't inefficient. So yeah. he was very good at finding the inefficiencies in the market. Great. Um, let's move on to, to number four, where you talk about um, price moves or immediate responses to changes in fundamentals. Um, and you're talking about that. In actuality, price, price moves commonly lag changes in fundamentals, and in addition, prices can be driven by emotional forces rather than plain fundamentals, and the price move often causes the news rather than the other way around. Right. Um, yeah, so this goes into the idea that people assuming, well, you know, the way the world works is news comes out and markets move. Well, if it's a completely surprise event, you know, uh, uh, the Straits of Hormuz would be closed or something like that. Yeah, you would have a spike in oil, and that would be directly related to the news coming out. So you can have situations like that. But most of the time, it doesn't work that way. Most of the time, the news is the, the information, the fundamentals are there, and the market takes a while to respond. Or sometimes, 
the market may anticipate and the fundamentals kind of develop and people realize why, why the market is doing what it's doing. But it's usually not just one reacting to the other. Uh, and I show some illustrations. In fact, I, the one I, I show one illustration in the book where copper was in like large surplus and you could easily see the relationship of copper inventories as they go higher and higher, prices had come, had come down and they were very high and prices were very, very low. And then inventories start to drop and they drop sharply for quite a while and prices don't do much of anything. And then finally a year and a half later they start to move up. And then they have their, their acceleration once once inventories are already at the bottom, there's sort of a real lag response, and then the crash is because it's over. I mean, that's the emotional state. It, it, it tends to overreact. So there's really a disconnect between the timing of fundamentals and the market responding, and that throws people. Um, one point I do make, which you just mentioned, was that a lot of times people will, uh, you know, they, they, they will, they'll look at the you know, what's going on in the market, they'll look for news on the wire services, and they'll say, oh, that's why the market is up, or that's why the market's down, you know, whatever the news explanation is. But the reality is that most of those times, it's not the news that it's explaining why the market's up or down. It's the market being up or down that it's explaining the news. And I, I use one example uh, in the book, which I took while I was writing that chapter. I just said, okay, let me make this point. Let me go to Newswire service and look what's on. And so this was a day that Bernanke was giving a talk, or had given a talk, I should say. And he'd given a talk in the morning before the market's opened finished right before the right before the market's over. And the market was um, was down, you know, significantly in the, in the early morning in the, in the morning hours. And the headline from this news service read, you know, market sells off on disappointment over uh, Bernanke's uh, comments or whatever the you know, specific uh, thing was. And that was the explanation. Then the market rallied and finished the day as much up as it was down early in the morning. Same news wire service, market market rallies as uh, uh, hopeful on hopeful signs of Bernanke's speech. Nothing had changed. He had given the speech already before the market opened. Right. It was the same speech. Nothing else changed. He didn't make any additional comments. But what happened was simply was the market was down initially and up. And they took the same exact news event. And in one case, it explained why the market was down. In the other case, it explained why the market was up. And it's clearly just a matter of trying to fit the news. To fit the, and that's the reality. If you really watch these things. You will see that when the market's up, they've got to go and find some reason why the market's up, even if there's no reason there. A lot of times the market is up simply because that's the trend. The market hasn't fully discounted the fundamental situation, and it's up that particular day. And, if, and, and, and it could be down because it's over. Some the market could be down not because it's bearish news, but simply because the market has gone up too much and it's over, overpriced. Right. Clear. I think I see that on TV a lot. Um, I wanted to, to zoom forward to, to misconception number 17 because I think this is uh, one of the most important ones and I think people will be able to uh, relate to this one a lot, which is uh, the idea that it's reasonable to use past returns in making future investments de decisions. Um, in your interview on, on Yahoo Finance, I, I found this interesting, you, you summed up the point saying that past performance is not only not a guarantee of future performance, it's not even a remote predictor of future performance. So once again, past performance is not only not a guarantee of future performance, it's not even a remote predictor of future performance. Um, so why is focusing on, on past uh, return alone such a, a big mistake? And um, how well, can risk be hidden in the track record? I think it's a, yeah, kind of a broad question. Well, yeah, that's a separate, that's a separate point. So let me talk about the return yeah. side. We can go to risk is a whole separate issue. Right. But on the question of past returns, so I guess you know this may be the biggest mistake that investors make, um, you know, universally. No, actually, you know, not only in the U.S. but I guess in, you know worldwide, and not only in our time but in all times. And that is, how do people pick their investments or pick when to invest? They look at how something is done over the last three, five years, and the stuff that's done really good. You know, hey, that's what you want to. That looks really good. Let's buy that. And, I mean, that's, you know, nobody's going to go and uh, see what's done poorly in the last five years and buy that. They buy what's done really well in the past five years. So the question is, how well does that really work? And the reality of it is that it doesn't work at all, but it's even worse than that. Uh, the, the truth is that many times, if you did the exact opposite, if you literally picked the worst thing in the past five years, you'd be better off. Um, and so you can look at it in different ways. I, 
Uh, I looked at a few different studies, but let's talk like one I did was like looking at S&P sectors. You got 10 S&P sectors. So I look at the strategy of every year you say, okay, what was the best, what was the best performing sector in the last year? I'll give a third of my money in that. The best last three years, the best performing sector, put a third of your money in that. In the last five years, put a third of, you know, what was the best performing sector? Put a third of your money in that. And then do the same thing, but look at the worst performing sector and do the same thing. Well, it turns out that you do better return risk-wise uh, with the going into the worst one than you do going into the best one. And when, uh, now in the case of the S&P, it was return risk, and it wasn't that much pure difference on the return side, but it was mostly return risk because you had much greater losses and, and equivalent returns. But the, uh, in the case of hedge funds, if you did the same thing, you pick the, look at picking the best strategies of the recent past periods versus the worst, the worst are tremendously better. You had much higher returns and, and much lower volatility and therefore stupendously better return to risk. And what, it, what that's basically saying, and, and in, insofar as the best performing sectors are going to be those hedge funds, you now the people that are going to be getting the money, because where do people go? They look at who are the best managers and the best managers are going to be in the best performing strategies. So in a lot of times, that's where the money is basically flowing. And, and what the statistics say, what the empirical evidence says, is that that is going to be, that's going to do much worse than if you just pick the worst ones. And, and so why does that happen? That happens because things that go up, you know, let's say you take a, a hedge fund strategy style, let's say convertible arbitrage, whatever it might be. If it's going up a lot, or, or, or take a sector might be made easier for the audience to relate. Say if you take a, a sector and you say uh, energy, uh, energy is a sector. And if that's been the best performing sector for the, you know, the, the last recent periods, uh, because energy prices had a big run up, well, that, that doesn't at all imply that it's going to be the best performing sector in the future periods. In fact, if you've had a really big increase in prices, like let's say you had in 2008 or whatever, you start, you start influencing a lot of uh, competitive supplies, you start getting, uh, you start getting conservation, and reduced, you know, reduced consumption. Um, you also have the effect of people, a lot of people, a lot of money has flowed into it and, and therefore a lot of, since money flows into these energy funds, they have to buy, they have to invest their money and that pushes, that it makes these energy related investments go up more than they should, they become very overpriced. And then people see it going up and then they buy that because of the emotional aspect and it gets into a bubble phase. And so what happens is the things that have done really well over the past are almost set up to be overpriced and to do worse going into the future. So you have this reversion to the mean effect. And people don't invest that way. People invest in what's done best and it really doesn't work. It, it, uh, it works very, very poorly. And that kind of relates to, to an earlier um, misconception, which is number six, which says it's best to invest in equities when the market is performing well, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that's, again, I, I think you would see, and you, actually I did find, I don't know if I included it in the book or not, but there are, you can, you can do charts where you can look at money flows and look at, the, uh, look at the stock market. And you can see that when the stock market's done really, really well, you're getting the best inflows into mutual stock mutual funds and then when it's done really badly you get the big outflows and uh, so one of the studies I did in the book was I looked okay if you if you invest after particularly bad five year ten year or particularly good I should say particularly good past ten year periods past twenty year periods what what do, what happens in the next five ten fifty twenty years and, and what happens is you get substantial underperformance uh, and conversely, if you invest after the market has done particularly, has a particularly poor 5, 10, 15, 20 year period, then you look at the forward 5, 10, 15, 20 year periods and those tend to be much, much better. And almost invariably, almost without exception, the re forward returns are much better after periods of bad performance. So that's why if you, you know, people who, particularly people who are just investing in stocks and are not trying to do their own market work, if you if you just try to invest when when you when people really hate stocks and when nobody wants to think when you, people think you're crazy to be putting money in stocks and where nobody wants to talk about stocks and where people are 
you know, when you're seeing covers about is the stock market dead and all this negative stuff, those are the right times to invest. And when you're seeing a lot of enthusiasm and all these, I go back to listening to the experts and all these experts telling you how, how we're in this new age of uh, rising stock markets and all this news is bullish, that's not, and market has been up in the last 10 years a lot, that's not a good time to go in. So that's the idea that, yeah, index investing is a good way for people who don't want to do their own work. But pick your time so you, you're entering when the markets have done poorly, not after they've done well. Right. Uh, another point I wanted to cover was uh, leveraged ETFs and uh, some of the problems and misconceptions with uh, leveraged ETFs. Right. Uh, you're saying they're, they're, the misconception is that they're a good way to get increased exposure and will deliver approximately the indicated multiple of the target. How, how right, is that a right. misconception? Uh, well, yeah. So, I mean, they will give you increased exposure. That part of it's correct. Uh, but the assumption that if you buy a 2x or 3x uh, ETF uh, and the market goes up, you'll get 2 or 3x times your money. Uh, or if you do the same thing on the short side, you'll, you'll, you know, it goes down. You make, that, that's where it breaks down. And the, in fact, it breaks down so badly, uh, it's truly shocking. Um, and in fact, the example I use in the book where I show uh, if you bought the 2x uh, long ETF and if you bought the 2x short ETF, you know, back when they started, around when they started and held it, you know, when I did finish the book about four or five years, uh, for about four or five year period. And actually those two investments sound like they're a wash, right? You're, you're buying a 2x and you're buying a short 2x and it sounds like it's a hedge which, you know, nothing much should happen uh, because, you know, you're, you're double long and double short. But the reality is that combined investment, they both lost, both legs lost, and they both lost a lot. And the bottom line, you would have actually lost almost all your money. Uh, and the reason why, and, or, or, and you know, in the market during that period, let's say the market was up on balance, I think it was up or down, right. let's say it was up on balance, uh, and even if you had the long ETF, you still, you still would have lost money, uh, even if you had the direction right. You, had, you not only had the direction right, but you double, and you still lost money. So what's going on? What's going on is the way these ETFs work is they rebalance every day. So if, if let's say the market was up, let's take a round number, I mean it's a whole lot, but let's say the market's up 5% in a given day, then they have to buy 5% more. If it's down 5%, they have to sell 5%. You know, they, have to, they always have to be matching uh, the index at the end of the day. And what that does is it, it amplifies the volatility effect. Because you have <coughs> volatility, uh, volatility is, people think volatility is just bad because of risk, but volatility is also bad because it hurts return. So a simple example, uh, take an extreme example so you can visualize it. If you have uh, an investment that goes up 50% in one year and down 50% in the next year, a lot of people will think and say that sounds like it breaks even, but no, you've lost 25% of your money because you go from 1,000 to 1,500 dollars when it goes up 50%. Then you lose 50%, you're down to 750. You're you've lost 25%, and that's that loss is the compounding effect. So compounding volatility, and the bigger volatility is, the bigger the compounding effect. And so when you have back and forth movement, back and forth movement, uh, and compounding, re results in in uh, loss, lo you know, just uh, amplified losses. Now, if you get all gains, if you get, you know, it's up 10% and up 10%, then the compounding helps. But if you're getting back and forth action, and let's face it, markets move back and forth, then the compounding hurts. And these 2x, 3x leverage instruments basically amplify that compounding effect and the volatility effect. And therefore, they, they, they can lose money even if you get the direction right. And people don't realize that, but it's absolutely true. Right, and talking about volatility, volatility and leverage were two other uh, factors that came up in the book, and uh, you kind of brought them up with respect to how they they they're in, inadequate in in really um, reflecting risk. Um, well, yeah. So, is that so correct? this volatility. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dan. Did you want to expound more or? Sorry, yeah, I, I don't know if you wanted to talk about them together or talk about volatility first and and then leverage. Yeah, they're they're separate issues, but they're yeah. both they're both yeah. They're, so they're, yeah, I would consider them separate issues. There are I mean I spend a lot of uh, a good part of the book talking about a lot of misconceptions about risk because 
that was just a very ripe area to talk about misconceptions. Uh, and one of them is you know, volatility related, um, and one of them is uh, leverage related. But let's, let's talk about volatility first then. So uh, volatility, or the standard deviation as a measure of volatility, has become, I think, synonymous with risk for many people. So when people say, you know, how risky is it, how vol or how volatile is it, it almost there's no distinction between those two terms. So if something is volatile, then it's high risk. If it's low volatility, it's low risk. And, and that can lead to a lot of uh, dangers and pitfalls. So particularly, let's take the low volatility. So people look at an investment, and the volatility is low. You know, they look at it, oh, that's, that's you know, you know so the, that it's going up, and it doesn't have any, doesn't have a lot of, uh, back in large movements, and so it's, it's gone up in a, in a nice way, and people are very comforted by that and say, it's okay, so it has low volatility, therefore it's a low risk investment. And that is a really dangerous assumption to make. Now, it may be true, sometimes it's true if you're dealing with very liquid investments, like highly liquid stocks, futures, FX, if you've got low volatility, you know, matches low volatility, uh, then it probably is, you know, low low risk, and that's fair to say. But for a lot of investments, low volatility doesn't tell you anything about risk because risk comes in two types of flavors. One flavor is the one that most people are familiar with. You know, this thing move, does it move around a lot. Uh, you know, uh, you know, a high beta stock is riskier than a low beta stock, so that's that's kind of one type of risk, and that's where people confuse volatility and risk. But there's another type of risk, which is episodic risk. It's, it's risk that's, it's like, um, you know, if you live on the coastline, you know, fl you, know uh, you may not have a flood for 20 years. And if you look at the 19 years where there's no flood, you know, floods aren't, it doesn't seem to be like a risk, not a risk factor, right? I mean, it's not, you know, I, unless, you're, unless you think of it, unless you're aware that it might be, but if you just look at the evidence, and you look at this property, there's been no floods here, there's no, you know, so it's, it's therefore it's not a risk. But no, it's an episodic risk. It's a risk that only happens once in a while. And then that 20th year, there's a flood, and then there's a tremendous risk, a tremendous damage, and, and it was there all along. That risk was there all along. It's just the type of risk that only manifests itself periodically. Now, investments are the same. You have lots of investments out there that the risk is not a matter of moving around a lot, that's the first type of risk, it's a matter of episodic risk. So take credit investments. You know, credit, you, you, you take, if you assume credit risk by, uh, say, buying high-yield bonds or a strategy that's, that's leveraging high-yield bonds or some other, uh, some other investment like that, and there's nothing wrong with that as an investment per se, and it may be the right investment at certain times. But if you look at it during a period of time where credit spreads have been coming in, which means that they're getting capital gains, and people who run those strategies are borrowing money at a lower rate and reinvesting at a higher rate, and they're leveraging it, so they're getting multiples of that, and they're not getting many downs because credit spreads are coming in, so um, they're really not showing losses. So it seems like it's a very low-risk strategy. It's not moving around a lot. It's going up steadily. It looks wonderful. But you get these credit events every, I don't know, five, ten years. And when you do, it changes the state completely. It's like, um, you know, it's like the difference between water and ice. I mean, they're not the same. Um, and, and it's the same, you know, you can have water up to a certain point, but then it turns to ice and it's very different. So once you get the, the credit event, then these investments uh, can have extraordinary risk. And, uh, these, the leverage investment, which was making multiples, now because it's leveraged and because credit spreads are going out, you're now u losing multiples. So, so it works. The leverage works in reverse, and you can have extremely large losses. So you go for six, seven years of nice, smooth performance, and all of a sudden you have this one year where you lose 30 percent. And right. it's not that the people will look at the track record, and if the track record doesn't include the credit episode, they will be oblivious or some of them may be oblivious to the risk being there. And they'll assume it's low risk because why? Because volatility was low. But that is where the mistake lies. Volatility is only one type of risk. If you have things that are illiquid or things that are exposed to credit or things that are short volatility, there's lots of categories to this. Uh, those, all those types of investments, they are prone to this episodic risk and it's hidden 
risk if it hasn't occurred during the track record, and therefore there may be tons of risk with low volatility. And that's where, where the big danger lies. Out of the money options was another example you brought up of that, is that right? That's, that's a perfect example, and it's one, in fact, the chart in the book I use, uh, which I show an actual manager who remains unnamed, but the track record, I show the track record and what you're referring to here, and it's sort of nice, wonderful, smooth chart. You show investors this, and they say, well, what a wonderful investment. I'd like to invest with this manager. And then I show the chart updated one month, and that nice, smooth, mountain-climbing chart one month later is a vertical cliff all the way back down to where it started. And, uh, you, and the difference was that, as you said, this was an option seller, and his strategy was to sell way out of the money options. So since the market never moves, or not, since the market rarely moves a lot like that, so almost every month he would be collecting premium and therefore he'd be making money. But then one month where there was an abrupt large move, these outer money options uh, uh, sort of had this, uh, get people familiar with options, but basically if you're out of the money, the market moves, the more the market moves against the position, the larger your position becomes. And so the risk becomes amplified as you lose money. And so it's very easy to lose 50, 60, 70 percent of your money, and so that can easily happen. So it's not that the risk wasn't there, the volatility was low, but, but when you had the event, then it was a huge risk. So that's what I'm saying. You have, people need to separate the concepts of low volatility from low risk. They are not the same. Uh, low, low volatility may be indicative of low risk, but it's entirely possible that you could still have high risk and low volatility. Great. I think in closing, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the psychology of a successful trader and, and some of the, the characteristics they need to have. Um, and so we know from the, the quote we mentioned earlier on that you're in favor of, of the trader developing their own methodology and not relying on someone else's methodology. And um, for example, uh, some other characteristics that you've mentioned are the ability to be flexible, to turn around on a dime, to not be emotional. Um, for example, um, if you're in a losing trade, to, to be able to not only exit the trade, a good, good trader will get out of a bad position, a great trader will reverse the position to be able to, to, to change and turn on a dime and, and be kind of emotionless. Can you talk a little bit about some of the, the characteristics that you, know, you think uh, people need to, to try and encourage within themselves to, to become successful in trading in that respect? Okay, well, well you know, there, there are a lot of them. Dan, actually, you hit, you hit probably the most important ones. And if I sort of have a limited amount of time and tell yeah. people what, what's important, right. uh, I'd have to actually go back to your point. And, and because I think the very, very first starting point is that people, you know, lots of times I get, I'll get an email or I'll get, um, or people meet me and ask me, and they, and they say, you know, I'm, you know could, do you know any market wizards I can apprentice with? I'll work for nothing, you know. And, and it's the wrong thing. It's the wrong way of approaching it because they're trying to find, or people, you know, buy systems looking for the answer, or people listen to the experts. They're looking to get it handed to them on a silver platter. And the problem with that is, is that what works for one person is not going to work necessarily for another person. It's really very dependent on your beliefs, the way you think, uh, how you use the information, your emotional state, on and on and on. It's like expecting to have uh, one suit size fit everybody. It's obviously not, you know, you're going to be five, six. It's not going to fit a suit for a six, four, four person. It's not going to fit you and vice versa. And it's ridiculous to try to think that you can do that. And it's no different with a trading style in the markets. Everybody's going to have some style that will work for them and lots of styles that won't. And you really, you can learn certain things from certain people, but you can't learn a trading style because it, 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 you have to find what works for you. You have to find what works fits your personality. And I think if people read the market, any of the market wisdom books, you'll see this time and time again. The people in those interviews, um, you can see that the approach they're using kind of matches their beliefs, the types of people they are, and how for one person, you know, technical analysis, no matter how good, would be a complete waste and counterproductive and get in their way because they just have disdain for it and don't believe it. And for another person, it might be the, reverse, the exact same, you know, the, the, the exact same type of thing in opposite with fundamentals. You know, but good fundamentals may 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 not work because they just don't believe it and so forth. So you have to decide, you know, 
crypto? It's our, our fundamentals right of Pateco. Which market do you want to trade? Are you short term? Are you long term? Uh, are are you more the type that's comfortable buying, you know, buying on weakness, or do you want to go with the threat? You know, all of these things really depend uh, on your innate personality, and you have to be able to stay with the strategy to, to use it effectively. So that is the most important thing I think to start start is you have to discover what is what works for you, and it's not the same. It's different for everybody, and you won't. And not everybody's going to find something that works. I mean, it's. It's not that easy, or else everybody would get rich in the market. So some people will, and those that do have to find a way that matches the way they think and their personality. Right, but the good news is that, is that it is possible, as we saw earlier yeah, on. That goes back you know. to the, <laughs> yeah, that goes back to the efficient market hypothesis being wrong. Yeah, it is possible. Not easy, but possible, right? Right, so, uh, right. Definitely not easy. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jack. I think at this point, let's turn it over to the audience and see um, see what questions we have coming in. Perhaps I can just read those out quickly. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but we've got another few minutes till we hit the hour. So, uh, anyone out there, please feel free to uh, type your question in the box. Doug says, uh, Market Wizards is his trading Bible, worth the totality of all the other books he's read. Um, Dan in the audience is asking what your view is on silver. Uh, I, <laughs> I actually dodged those questions. and uh, Well, let me explain why I dodged those questions. I dodged those questions because, first of all, I don't put myself out as a market wizard. Uh, I'm not, uh, or a great trader or anything. Uh, I have chronicled people who are, but I don't tend to be one myself. And uh, I also be contradicting myself that you shouldn't be listening to me, even though I was going to give you my opinion. I mean, I could pull up a chart on, on silver and I'll have some opinion about what I think it's going to do. But hey, you shouldn't be listening to me either, uh, because you know I'm, uh, I don't even consider myself an expert. But that, that, the point is, um, it, it's just like uh, that. I've got kind of explained why I, I don't uh, answer that. Sure. Um, so there's another question. So general questions on the direction of the market you prefer to stay away from. Jack, is that correct? There was one question about about the whether the uh, the recent bull market is coming to an end, but you, you might want not want to well, address yeah, that no, one either. In broad sense, you know. So um, you know, I, I actually sometimes will answer very broad questions like that, not giving advice. Yeah. Um, and, and there were there are times where I would have had a strong opinion on that question, uh, uh, and I, you know just simply well I'll give you an example where but and, it, and I say this not to, this won't be helpful to the person's kind of question what, what what's going to happen in the next six months or type of thing but but just a way about thinking about markets that question I actually did answer uh, for a good deal of time because. Um, at the end of 2000, when we had that giant, you know, that, that bubble and that big top, um, just from my knowledge of his, the history of markets, I, I just knew there, I knew of no past episode where you had a major, you know, climactic top of that type in any market where you were recovered in any short-term period. And it usually took a minimum of, well, not even 10, 15, 20, sometimes more years until the market's recovered. So, but now we're 13 years into it, so that argument becomes more, you know, less, less. In 2007, 8, the fact that we were coming back to those highs made it unlikely that you would see an extension of the bull market because, for that reason, you know, now with 13 years in, it's probably still too early, I think, for it to get a real dramatic, you know, that move. But uh, but it's less compelling because at least you've had you know 13 years and it becomes a little bit more possible. Um, but uh, you know, I guess I think you probably still need more time before you have a real true uh, you know extended bull market. So I say it's a much weaker argument now than, than it was back then. Okay. Here's another question. Uh, going back to some of the people you interviewed. Um, Wow, there's so many questions coming in, I'm losing them. Um, there was uh, a question coming from New York asking, 
which which trader among all of the traders you interviewed um, were you most impressed by? It's hard to say. Um, well, actually, I mean, I think Thorpe. I actually, I I always said that I, I didn't have an answer to that question, um, but I think uh, and I, uh, Thorpe was in the last, most recent what hedge fund market was a book I did. Yeah. Um, I think of all the people, I I would say who was the single most impressive individual. I think it would probably be Thorpe, just because the list of his accomplishments is truly staggering. Um, yeah, I mean, for one thing, uh, which most people don't know, I mean, I didn't know it until I spent a couple of days interviewing him, uh, but he actually came up with the uh, option price, the Black-Scholes option pricing form, or a mathematical uh, equivalent version of it, many years before they did, uh, but he didn't publish it, and he just oh. was making too much money using it. I mean, that's <laughs> one of his accomplishments. He, he, be, he, he changed the way casinos had to be like, he kind of, that whole thing about turning, he, this, he actually beat roulette as well. This, that there's too long to go into, but he had all these different accomplishments. He was also the first hedge fund, uh, market neutral fund, the first stat arb fund, the first convertible arb fund. Uh, he had this incredible uh, uh, string of returns to risk. You know, so on and on and on. So I guess of all the people, uh, you know, up near, you know, a PhD mathematician, a physicist, you know, he just did a lot of stuff that was, was fairly uh, impressive and a nice, a nice guy and not ego, you know, not an ego about it and. Uh, uh, so uh, I found him to be, you know, I guess if I had to pick one person, I'd say Thor. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jack. I think we should leave it there. We don't want to take up too much of your day, but it's been a real honor having you on and uh, being so gracious, gracious to join us today. Um, and at this point, um, Tim, are you still there? I just want to see if Tim wants to uh, to wrap it up. I am, yeah. Yep, I'm Great, here. Tim, if you want, if you, I just if you want to say a couple of words, um, go ahead. Big thank you okay. to Money Show for sure. having me on. Really appreciate that. Yeah. And thank uh, you to Dan and, and to Jack. I appreciate that. Both of you being on here. Everybody will get a link to the recording of this tomorrow, about noon Eastern time. We'll get it out to everybody. So uh, make sure you check out traderslog.com and make sure you check out uh, Jack's book. So thanks everybody for being here. And right, you can learn more about Jack at jackschwager.com, and he's also on Twitter, uh, Jack Schwager. Thank you so much, Jack, and thank you everyone for attending. Thanks, thanks, Dan. Take Bye -bye. care. The organizer has ended the session and this call